Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, or as John Campy has called me, your existential Mr. Rogers, Robert Meyer Burnett, here with a John Campy mailbag on this day, Thursday, June 16th, 20. <laughs> 22. Now, as you know, on the John Campia show, we answer your questions live. We open up the super chats for a few minutes and we only open them up for a few minutes so we can read your questions live on the show. But any other time, seven days a week, day or night, wherever you are in the world, all you have to do is go to the link right down below and you can send us a question, a comment, a review, whatever you want at that link. And we will, if we deem it appropriate, I mean, I'm still waiting for like a whole inappropriate mailbag. Don't know if we're ever going to do that. think it would be fun. But if we do deem your questions appropriate, we will read them here on the mailbag. And with that, let's just jump right into the letters. Michael Jones sends in a tip and says, I lived in North Carolina on Sunday, took my kids to an 1120 a.m. showing of Jurassic Park Dominion, actually Jurassic World Dominion, at the Regal Theater. There were no trailers. The movie started at 1120 a.m. People in the theater <laughs> applauded. Michael Jones, that's the kind of theatrical experience. I mean, I have to say, I would have been a little disappointed because like our, my late, great, beloved Arclight, they would show three trailers in and out. I like. I, I feel I need at least a couple of trailers. But you know what? I understand if you're at a place where they just show you commercials and trailers in and out when the movie starts on time. No wonder they applauded. Kudos to you, sir. That, my friend, that is great movie going right there. I hope you like the movie. Uh, CJ sends in a tip and says, season three of The Boys has been great. I concur. And even though it seems like Stan Edgar, I think he wants it. Even though it seems like Stan Edgar, meaning that he's out. I think he wants it that way. Maybe he gave the tip about Soldier Boy, knowing he'd wreak havoc and Homelander would look bad. Everyone will beg Edgar to come back and fix it. CJ, couldn't agree with you more. Stan Edgar, he is Machiavellian to the extreme. He's always one step ahead of everyone. He knows where all the berries, the berries, all the bodies are buried at Vought. I'm with you 100%. I am a Stan Edgar Stan. So there you go. I'm with you. Cody Hunt Films, one of two, says, I'm only five episodes into the offer, but the cast is incredible. I'm blown away by the casting of Pacino and Brando. Incredible casting. They capture their essence perfectly without being a caricature. I don't know about the real man, but good as Bob Evans is so entertaining to watch. Let me just tell you, Cody. Oh, let me go to your second part here. Um, Second part is, as a media director, the situations are so relatable. Having your producer doing whatever it takes for the director and the, co and the compromises you have to make throughout production, I can't imagine anyone better to play Coppola than Dan Fogler. Well, Cody Hunt Films, I'm with you 100%. I, whether or not, you know, according to the, the, the film, and it is based on Al Ruddy's uh, recollections of making The Godfather, according to him, he had to solve every single problem. I don't care. I think the cast is great. I thought Giov Giovanni Ribisi went a little too far, but you know what? The rest of the cast is uniformly excellent. I just watched the last episode, the 10th episode. I'm going to be sorry to see these characters go. If there is a god, Matthew Good would be able to play Rob Robert Evans, and they would they would go through his entire career he is so good. I love the cast. I think the cast is uniformly excellent. Juno Temple has been great, too. Everybody's been great, so I do agree with you. But the offer is, sadly, as of today, episode 10 dropped. The limited series is over. Over, if you're an AHA fan. Sorry about that. I would love to see more, but Matthew Good, man. He better win an Emmy to play Bob Evans because he's great. Uh, Noah Drazen says, Hey, John and Rob, it's me. Just curious with D23 coming soon. Do you think we'll finally get an Avengers five announcement from Marvel? Maybe secret wars. Also, I make your guys show a part of my daily routine and I appreciate everything you guys do. Well, no, it's a good question. I honestly don't think, I mean, in this day and age, I'm never surprised by anything, but I don't think that we are going to get an Avengers five announcement or a secret wars announcement yet. I think there's a little bit more to do. I think we would get one maybe at the end of the next year. Uh, that's just what I would guess. But again, after D23, who knows? Um, but I don't expect to get an Avengers announcement. I think the biggest announcement we're going to get is Fantastic Four. Yep. Roy 
says, hey, Rob, I was able to secure my pre-order of Top Gun Maverick, the 4K Steelbook from Best Buy. I already watched the film four times. Good for you, sir. Also, I took my seven-year-old to see Jurassic World Dominion. He loved it. It was disappointing for me. It was just okay. Well, here's the thing, Roy. As you know, sometimes I can only imagine uh, what my parents thought of half the movies I dragged them to, but because they know I love them, they would continue to take me. Um, I can't wait to get my Top Gun Maverick steelbook. I ordered it as well to go with my Top Gun steelbook. So uh, congratulations on getting that, and congratulations for being a good dad and taking your son to the movies. I think that's really important. My parents did for me, and it shaped my life. Hence, I'm here talking to you. Simon Peter says, I don't feel that I should or want to see The Flash in the cinema starring Ezra Miller. Ezra Miller has demotivated me from wanting to even care to see him in The Flash. Well, Simon, you know, the, the sad part about this is he's just doubling down on all of his shenanigans. Uh, he's he's I've never seen somebody somebody burn their career down as thoroughly as he seems to be doing to doing. And and frankly, I, I can't believe he would do this to his collaborators. Um, he's he's clearly showing that he doesn't care about the studio. He doesn't care about anyone. And apparently, uh, you know, he's got concerned parents of the of the person he's run away with and they want to know what's going on. And he's throwing caution to the wind and now taunting the authorities. So I think it's no good for anyone. It's really an unfortunate situation. And it's even more unfortunate in that I hear The Flash is a good movie. So, I mean, what about all of his collaborators? Does he not care for all the people that work so hard on the film that continue to work hard on the movie? It's going to be a weird artifact. What happens to that film? I mean, I don't know. I can't imagine. I hope it doesn't get shelved if it's as good as it's supposed to be. But it doesn't look good. Hitchcock is the GOAT. Hi, John and Rob. I'm asking this out of ignorance. You said it would cost too much to recast and reshoot The Flash, but wouldn't it co cost a lot less to recast and reshoot and lose a lot of money versus shelving it and losing all of the money since the recast is inevitable anyway? Well, Hitchcock is the goat. I mean, here's the thing. Uh, this is a $200 million movie. It's a very expensive proposition, and to reshoot it could cost another $200 million. And unfortunately, you can't throw necessarily good money after bad. They have the film now. It's in the can. It's already done. Is it worth it to recast someone else in the role? Or do they take the insurance write-off? I don't know how it's all going to work. But I can tell you this. If they have to reshoot the principal cast, the, your lead, you're basically starting from scratch. There would be very little that you could use, even with trickery. And when you're using modern effects technology, it's incredibly expensive to do that. Your lead, who plays multiple versions of himself, is the star of this movie. I mean, to redo it, I mean, it's not unprecedented that they've reshot the movie again, or at least not a movie that's necessarily entirely finished. I just, I, I think it's too cost prohibitive. It really would be you're going to spend another $200 million, and they would never be able to justify that expense. So Eddie Valerio says, John... How about Warner Brothers finishes The Flash and gives it a limited theatrical run? However, all profits made will be donated to a charity of their choosing. Warner Brothers gets their money back, gets to fire Ezra and a good bit, a bit of PR out of it, and then dump it on HBO Max. You know what, Eddie? That's not a bad idea because they could put the film out. They could announce that they're taking all the profits and giving it to various charities. Those are a write-off. That's actually a pretty good idea. I like that idea a lot. I don't know if they would do that, and I don't know if they would They would still then turn around. I mean, I guess turning something like this into something good to help people, I think people could get behind that. Not a bad idea. I don't know what the legalities of that would be, but it's not a bad idea. I like it. I like it. I don't know if they could do it, but I like it. Roy sends in a tip and says, hey, John and crew, I recently watched a documentary called Electric Boogaloo, the rise and fall of Canon films. I've seen this documentary. It's terrific. It got me thinking, is Netflix the new Canon films because they're trying to put out so much content as possible like Canon used to do? Well, the difference is Netflix at least knows what how much money they have. Uh, Canon, man, they were borrowing money. They were getting the, the the Mario Kassar and Andrew Vanya were looking all over for cash. Sometimes they would spend all their money on something like, uh, like Cutthroat Island, Rennie Harlan's Cutthroat Island. That didn't go well. 
So I think Netflix is a little bit more, aside from their stock position, but in terms of their cash flow, they're a little bit more solvent than what happened with Kuroko. So, or Canon, pardon me. I'm talking Canon, not Kuroko. Did I see uh, Menachem Golan? I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. I just mentioned uh, uh, Kuroko, not Canon. Electric Boogaloo is about Canon films. That is uh, not Mario Kassar and Andrew Vanya. That's Kuroko. That's different. They're much richer. Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus is Canon. See, brain fart. I've been talking for four hours. So yes, but but my my premise is the same. Netflix has a a better, a much more solid um, uh, uh, cash flow. And Yoram Globus, the empresarios behind Canon Films, they were always making schlock until they didn't. They did not make Cutthroat Island. That was Kuroko. Different thing. Please excuse me. I would edit this out and start all over again. But why? I've, I've explained myself. So there you go. Sometimes, at least I corrected myself. So there you go. Uh, Paul C. sends in a tip and says, I can't stand the Batman, Joker, Harley trio that Warner Brothers and DC are selling to us all over the place. Enough is enough for me. It's this policy that leads neophytes to believe that DC's DNA is limited to these characters and this obsession with realism. Paul, totally agree. I mean, I think, you know, having Joker, Harley, and Batman is something that in a way is inclusive. They can always go to it. It always makes money for them. It's solid. Uh, but I totally agree with you. I mean, unfortunately, they're the only characters that the powers that be really know when you get into it. Like, okay, how can we bring more of the female audience into Batman? I mean, can we give Batman a... I mean, there's Catwoman. And I think there's a lot of other villainesses they could use too. And I, I agree with you. But... On the other hand, in terms of devil's advocate, I would say this, that Joaquin Phoenix is Joker and adding Harley to that mix and concentrating on their relationship and making it a musical with Lady Gaga, that's something new. But, you know, I loved Anne Hathaway's Catwoman in Dark Knight Rises. I'd like to see more female villains. <laughs> DC, they have a great lineup of female villains. Let's see more of them. And let's not do what they did to Cheetah in Wonder Woman 84. Hitchcock is the goat comes on to say, I'm so pumped to see Cillian Murphy's Hake on Oppenheimer. I'm currently two thirds into the final season of Peaky Blinders and damn, he's terrific. Killian is a Killian of Cillian. Killian Murphy is great. He's a great actor. I mean, I loved him in like uh, 28 days later. Uh, he's awesome. And any concerns about him being a lead opposite that big name cast, have no fear. He can act toe-to-toe -to -toe with anyone. I agree. He is fantastic in Peaky Blinders. He's a great actor. Look, I liked him as the Scarecrow in the Batman in, in Nolan's Batman movies, too. He just wasn't given that uh, that much to do. He had a lot more to do in the first Batman and Batman Begins, but I'm a huge fan of his. I couldn't agree more. And Peaky Blinders rules if you haven't seen it. Really, really good. Uh, Sam Fisher says, I am watching... I am watching Star Trek Discovery, and while I'm really liking it, it doesn't feel like Star Trek. No, it doesn't. I would have loved it if the show was more like Eureka, episodically fixing an experiment when one-on-one -on -one ship goes wrong, not fighting a war. It's a science vessel. Sam, I'm happy you're enjoying it, but your analysis is absolutely correct. Uh, that show is all over the place. It changed premise every season. Uh, it also made no sense in the Star Trek universe. The tech didn't make any sense. The uniforms made no sense. And no one act, acts like they're on a military vessel. I don't even think the actors know their ranks. And um, I'm not going to rank on this show any more than I'm ranking on it right now. So I appreciate you're enjoying it, but I agree with your assessment. It's a science vessel. It's a vessel of exploration. Drew Gretsch says, hey, John and crew. A few months ago, you talked about how Carl Urban said he was filming The Boys through the end of 2022, but it seems like season four is still being written. However, the Varsity spinoff series is shooting right now. Could Butcher be in it? Oh, I would, I would bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow the Butcher will be really, uh, he'll be, he's, he's going to be in it. I think for sure. You got to have the Butcher in it because why not? Uh, he's he's going to recruit from them. Maybe I don't know, but you know. As you know, my love of Butcher, he's right there. So the more Butcher, the better. That's what I say. 
Uh, Jonathan Namella says, hello, John and crew. I just want to... <laughs> I just went to Riverside Wrestling Con. Breaking news, Brett the Hitman Hart just signed by Eagle Belt and put Vince, screwed Vince after Montreal screw job. Jerry the King lawyer, Jeff Hardy, and Donzen signed it. I met them all. Bring on the filthy. Jonathan, I have to say, I don't know or understand anything you just wrote us. I am so out of that realm. I got to ask Ray Ora. Let me go to Ray. Ray, please, can you, I don't know if you can go to the camera. Uh, I don't know. Um, what did he say? What did our viewer just say? Well, he just said that Brett the Hitman Hart, which was my favorite wrestler at the time of uh, when he was wrestling in WWF. He's a Canadian wrestler. John knows who he is. He's one of the greatest of all times in ring performers. He got a good autograph right there. The rest, he, the rest, impressive. But Brett the Hitman Hart, just because he got an autograph from him, I'll forever be jealous. Because he had me at one time, when it wasn't so acceptable, wearing all pink. And just because the, Brett the Hitman Hart would always, his gear was pink. And I would wear pink just to support him because I'm a, with a Brett Hart shirt. I went through all that torment. But just because he was the best. He's the best there is, the best there was. The best there ever will be is his slogan. So Wow, all right. Yeah. Well, Ray, thanks for that because I would not want to let our viewer down by being an idiot on the subject of wrestling, which admittedly I am. Uh David's <laughs> David's sock and lotion. You know, for somebody who has a lot of socks and lotion, you're uh you're a busy boy on the internet. It's hard not to compare Lightyear to Toy Story if I grew up with it, and I grew up with Tim Allen. If they didn't want it to be compared, they shouldn't have made it Lightyear, especially since Toy Story 4 was only a few years ago. Maybe if they waited. Well, David, I mean, I have to say that that I love the idea that Lightyear is the movie that Andy was a fan of and that Buzz Lightyear was just one of his many toys from this movie. So I, I love the way that they've delineated the two things. Like, it would be like, it would be like, like me not liking Star Wars, even though I have hundreds of Star Wars toys. So I think what they did was really clever and really interesting. But I know if you grew up with the Toy Story franchise, how people might not be able to separate the two. I, however, found it clever and I really liked Lightyear. Did you like it? Did you enjoy it? Because I'd love to know. Sam Fisher says, weird idea, but I want to see a music biopic cinematic universe. <laughs> where the actors are recast as those artists in another music biopic, like the actors from the Beatles biopic show up in the Stones biopic, reprising their roles and vice versa. Hey, I think that'd be awesome. Expensive, but awesome. There's there's also, what is it, I'm Not Here? Is it I'm Not Here, the Bob Dylan movie, where all these different actors and actresses played Bob Dylan? But I like that. A musical biopic, does that mean that Taron Edgerton always has to come back and play Elton John? Or Joaquin Phoenix comes back and plays Johnny Cash. I mean, that would be kind of cool. I uh, It'd be very expensive, but I, I like the idea. Angela Bassett could come back and play Tina Turner. Why not? Good idea. Garden Variety Vagabond says, John and Rob, we can tell that John was not present for the Joker 2 musical discussion as Moulin Rouge was not mentioned once. Well, it's true. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, I don't, I, I, I love Moulin Rouge. I don't think of Moulin Rouge as much as, uh, it is, I guess, a musical, more as a romance. But yeah, uh, you're, you're right. That should be mentioned more. Do the can, can, can. We can, can, can mention Moulin Rouge more than we should. I love Moulin Rouge. I think the discussion, you can't talk about Baz Luhrmann's filmography without talking about the Red Curtain trilogy, which is, of course, Strictly Ballroom. And then it's uh, Moulin Rouge. And is it? Uh, it's one more, and I forget what it is. It's not Romeo and Juliet, is it? I don't know. Maybe it is. Who knows? Could be. Who knows? That's a little West Side story for you. <laughs> Captain Dr. Hawkeye says, will the, I don't know why, uh, will the iconic Star Wars opening crawl ever return? It should. So far, we've only seen it showcased in the episodic saga films. None of the recent shows or spinoffs have it. I hope it returns as it's an homage to old serials and a triumphant part of cinema history. Hashtag stay sweaty. Well, Captain Dr. Hawkeye Pierce, let me tell you. Nice match reference. Love to hear that. I don't know why every Star Wars show does not start with a crawl. It's setting the scene. It goes back to the roots. The idea that it's only on the saga, the Skywalker saga movies is lame. So I'm with you 100%, bruh. 
I wish it would come back. Bring it back. Give it to me now. I want it. Uh, Advith Rajadurai. Advith Rajadurai. I know you would not have followed this, but Disney lost the streaming rights to the IPL, which is India's Cricket League. The total broadcast rights are now worth $6.2 billion. It is the second highest in the world below the NFL at around $5 million per match. Wow. Well, Adveth, you know, we in America, we don't even know what that is. If you were to say the Cricket League, um, we don't have cricket in this country. I love cricket. I learned I actually played cricket, went to cricket matches when I was working on uh, Lord of the Rings in uh, the the, the uh, special features on the extended versions down in Wellington, New Zealand. I'm a huge cricket fan, and you know I, I could see that. I can imagine like at the Disney boardroom here in Burbank when they're trying to decide whether they're going to re up for the cricket league. Some Americans going to be like, "What is? I don't know what cricket is." You know, and if you're if you're a Bollywood movie fan, the movie Lagan is all about cricket. Uh, watch it. I'm a fan. I love cricket. Royce Freeman says, if somebody has a medical marijuana card, what is your opinion on them doing a little bit before coming to a film set or show like yours? Well, you know, we talked about that today, but I will, since you ask again, I will reiterate my answer. Um, a medical marijuana card is great. And I, I, if you've got the dank nugs and you're, you're, you're um, using it medicinally, that's fine. But I don't think that any kind of drug use for whatever reason. I mean, unless it's, I guess, maybe prescription pain medication or something. Um, I think being on any kind of medicine or drugs while you're on a movie set adds a heightened, um, call it safety. If you're not, if you're not completely unaltered on a movie set, you could be a liability. I mean, movie sets they don't seem like dangerous places. There's a lot of electricity. There's a lot of points. There's a lot of hanging lights. There's a lot of things that you can bump into. So I would prefer, especially as a producer myself, that would be carrying the insurance, that people are not on set altered in any way, shape, or form, even if it's prescribed, because if your reaction time is 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 affected you can get yourself hurt or others. So it's not because I'm a fuddy-duddy. Hey, if you've got the dankest nugs, blaze up all you want. Just being on a movie set, it's a little problematic, even if you have a prescription. That's what I would say. From Mexico with love, sends in a tip. I fly to you. Uh, about the message on Kenobi, I took it as a great showing of the glimpses into the dark side that Kenobi saw and ignored him and dealing with those memories in the present, which I absolutely loved, even if they looked like 50-year-olds. You know, I don't I don't disagree with you, but but I think that the messages that was conveyed in the flashback scene in this week's episode of Kenobi was already kind of understood. I mean, we learned that that uh Anakin was impulsive. That's why he wasn't being made a master. And the idea that he always goes for the kill shot or whatever, I can see that it informs his character, but isn't that stuff we already knew? I think it was pretty clear that both in Attack of the Clones and in Revenge of the Sith, we were right there. I mean, you know, when he kills Count Dooku at the behest of Palpatine, he goes for the kill shot. And I don't think we need to see that same lesson reiterated again, but that's just me. Your mileage may vary. But thank you from Mexico with love uh bill will or big big will like big willy style big will says hi john and crew so i'm loving the miss marvel tv show so far the thing that's pulling me into the show are the music choices the music for this show reminds me a lot of guardians of the galaxy soundtrack it's fun and blends in perfectly your thoughts and bring on the filthy look i agree i've only seen the first episode so far i love the music choices in the film you know they're called like needle drops or source cues great stuff and i think you're right i mean equating them with with guardians of the galaxy is correct but you know dealing with high school life and all that so much of being in high school was having music uh add to our emotional lives music was the externalization at least when i was in high school of your inner turmoil or whatever was going on you know uh i have such strong memories of being in high school and having certain pieces of music uh mean all kinds of things to me happy sad big life events 
making out, getting laid. I mean, music was a big deal for me in high school, and there's so many memories that come flooding back based on music. The fact that Miss um, Marvel has such a great musical identity, I think is great, and you're right. Just like Guardians of the Galaxy. They're spending some money on that show. K Major, one of two, says a trio of aliens crash landed on Earth while attempting to escape the evil General Medulla, who has taken over their home planet. A soldier and a bio cybernetic robot do their best to protect the princess and sole heir to the throne from space mutants sent to kill her. When evil threatens to overpower them, the symbiotic defense program is activated, or the symbionic defense program is activated, which allows the trio to form the cyber giant symbiotic titan to vanquish their foes. Okay, so that's what uh, Mr. Tarkovsky, Tarkovsky, that's what his animated series is about. Well, based on your description, K-Major, I am in. I got to watch that. Uh, symbionic titan. I thought it was symbiotic titan, but symbionic titan. Good stuff. I have to watch it now. I've got to find it. So there you go. Arjan sends in a tip and says, man, I am a sucker for Star Wars. That's what Disney hopes. Uh, when watching Obi-Wan, I see the lazy writing and inconsistencies, but I don't care. I grew up with the originals and the prequels and just light up when anything Star Wars is on my screen besides eight and nine. Is that a problem? Laugh out loud. Well, here's the thing, Arjan. Why apologize for something that you love? Never apologize for something that you love, as long as it's not illegal or it doesn't harm anyone else. You should never apologize to something like that. I mean, I look, I love Star Wars. I'm just more critical. I don't understand with all the money at their disposal, they are not making excellent entertainment always out the gate. And it's not just, I mean, for me, I am critical of my stories, but that's because this kind of storytelling deserves the best of the best. And I feel they fall down on the job sometimes. I mean, you got Ewan McGregor, but why are the effects so lame? But I understand. Like, I'll watch anything Star Trek. People say to me clearly, because I'm angry half the time about it now. And uh, I love Star Trek. Uh, even when it's bad, I'll still watch it so I can, you know, yell about it on the internet later. But I think that what's what's important is that you like something. And Obi-Wan, it's not horrible. I mean, it, it's certainly watchable. For me, I just wish it was a better story. It was more insightful. It affected me more. And it's not because I watched Star Wars and Empire as a kid. By definition, I think both of, both Star Wars and Empire are very, very good movies. As I've moved through my life, I've seen each one of those movies in excess of 100 times, and I still love them. And I want Obi-Wan to be of that caliber. But if it's not, and you still get something out of it, kudos to you, and why shouldn't you, by God? Life is too short. Love the things you love with all of your heart. That's what I say. Uh, Garrett says over or under 40% that Kingo may appear in Miss Marvel. Ooh. Ooh, I never thought about that. You know what? Kamel Najiani is in Obi-Wan. Why not be in Kingo coming up and showing up in Miss Marvel? That's a great idea. I think that might happen. I think that, I don't know for sure, but that's a great idea. I love that. So I'm going to say over 40%. Good idea. Chloe Fanning says, today, the writers seem to have forgotten the basic fundamentals of Doctor Who, or, oh, you're not about Doctor Who. <laughs> today, the writers seem to have forgotten the basic fundamentals of who, what, when, where, and why. Nowadays, it seems all about the who and never the why, and where the story is going. Of all the five W's should be explained within a couple of episodes. Hey, man, Chloe, that's a great assessment. I Look, I, I think the writing has been falling down lately because people are not you know, if you're a musician, you spend most of your life playing, studying music, uh, all different kinds of music. It's in your blood. I would have thought writing would be the same way. And, you know, when you're a musician, you listen to all kinds of music. You're studying music from all, all over the place. You're, you're, you're enamored of the musical form. Well, with writing, I would think the same thing would be true. You should be a voracious reader to know how to write. And I think the problem is, unless you have a literary background, meaning you have studied literature, you've read a lot of literature, I don't think you can ever be a great writer. I think the problem with a lot of writers today is they've seen a lot of TV and movies, but they haven't read enough. And storytelling all comes from oral and literary traditions. And when you don't have an understanding of those things, I think you're falling down on the job. So I agree with you. I think modern writers need to read more and study their craft more. Uh, Obi-Wan is the goat sends in a tip and says, hi, Rob and or John. No, it's just me. 
this Obi-Wan is really working from. I love this past episode, and the finale has me really hyped. Every episode I go in excited, but expect nothing, and 95% of the time I'm not disappointed. Each episode is a fun adventure for me, and this is one of two, and I'm predicting that Qui-Gon will show up in uh, like the first minute of final scenes and obi-wan will be finally ready to train with him and that will lead into season two if we get a season two anyway thanks for the content and show and bring on the filthy hope you are feeling better john well obi-wan is a goat again if you're loving the show and it's really working for you i think that's fantastic and it should i mean i do think that qui-gon jinn they certainly set it up that he'll probably show up and obi-wan will train with him maybe that's what he's been doing in his cave between the end of this show and the beginning of the original star wars He's just hanging out with Qui-Gon training, um, which, by the way, I would watch. I'm there for that. Um, and I'm glad you like the show. I mean, it makes me it makes me happy when people find things that they like and they're delving into them and they're really enjoying them. I always think that's the best way to be because, man, there's a lot of great stuff and also bring on the filthy. Um, Lord Genome sends in a tip and says, hey, John or me, you said that you dropped My Hero Academia because of the Protag's annoying voice. I don't watch it myself. I'm just wondering if you tried switching to the subtitled version or if that's something you or Rob or Chris, Chris consider when watch, watching anime. Let me tell you something. I do not watch dubbed anime. All the anime I watch is subtitled, always and forever. Just like when I watch a the, – the only, the only Asian – derived film that I think is acceptable to watch a, a English language dub is the Lone Wolf and Cub movie series. There's six of them. Two of them were dubbed into the 1980 masterwork Shogun Assassin, which by the way, you've got to watch dubbed because the experience of it is the greatest thing in the world. It also has the greatest single voiceover performance by a child actor in any movie and no, I am not being facetious. If you can find Shogun Assassin, watch it. It'll change your life. Or at least give you a little bit of a chuckle. It's great. It's great. So then Lord Genome, there you go. Um, I wish you were tacos. Well, you know what they say. If God didn't want you to eat it, he wouldn't have made it look like a taco. Hi, Rob and John. I'm curious why there aren't any Piers Anthony movies or shows. I really think the incarnations of immortality books would be a great limited series. Thoughts? You're absolutely right. Um, on a Pale Horse, Piers Anthony books, those are great. And the incarnations of immortality series would make a great series. So, I, you know, I, I, you know, and also his Xanth books, The Magic of Xanth. But the incarnations of immortality series, when I read those, uh, I was in junior high school. Those books are so great. And people have tried over the years, but now with the streaming world, what a perfect series to adapt. Um, why I'm sure somebody owns them and they've tried to 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 get them. So and look, Taco, I'm a huge fan of tacos. And I think you're right. So thanks for that name. Oh, and that brings us to the end. What a great way to end. Now I'm going to be thinking about tacos for the rest of the day, if you know what I'm saying, and I think you do. Uh, I want to thank all of you for generously supporting this channel via tips. Uh, remember, our our um, our um, um, uh, uh, our operators are standing by 24-7 at the link below, and you can send us a letter, and if we deem it appropriate, I will read it or John will read it. Maybe Chris and I will read it. Maybe John and I will read it. Maybe Ray Ora will read your letter on the mailbag. We very much appreciate that. That means you keep the channel going. You give us interesting things to talk about. And I want to thank producer Jonathan Voico for producing today's mailbag. I want to thank Ray Ora for, I finally got a good laugh out of him through innuendo, which is awesome. And I want to thank everybody who wrote in today. You can find me, Robert Meyer Burnett, on Instagram at Robert Meyer, R M Burnett. Find me on Twitter at Burnett R M, or find me on my own YouTube channel, Post Geek Singularity, or the website, postgeeksingularity.com, where you can write me letters, and I read those letters out free of charge on my own channel. So there you go. And thank you very much. And we'll be back with the John Campy Show tomorrow.